Coming up on World Stories, gift wrapped from Moscow with love. Tourists giving Catalonia a pass. But first to Ethiopia, where the cartoon characters Tibap Girls stand up for girls' rights, tackling the problems many of them face. The heroines wield magical powers and encourage girls to find their own way. A look of captivation on their faces. This school in Addis Ababa is showing pupils the first episode of Tibab Girls. Tibab means wisdom in Amharic. In the series, three clever superheroines fight for the equality of girls and women. One out of five girls in Ethiopia married before age 15. And most of them will never go back to school. That means they are robbed from their opportunity to succeed in life. Tibab Girls wants to change this. It's important to the program's creators that children can identify with the show. So they organize screenings of the pilot episode at local schools to see if pupils like it. We're doing this like in different parts of Ethiopia also. So there we have seen so many girls crying because they know what she's been through. So that is something close to their heart, something they know, so they can connect with that. After watching the show, the children write down what they liked or didn't like and which storylines they want to see continue. I thought it was great because it was about girls' issues. I've never seen anything like it before. Tubab Girls is the brainchild of Bruktawi Tigabu, the trained nurse so she could no longer ignore the plight of young women in Ethiopia. So I said, how can I solve this huge problem? Obviously, I couldn't build kindergarten everywhere. So I start thinking, how can I reach millions of children in my country with less cost, but with quality education? Bruktawit has already produced three successful TV and radio series, which educate children across Ethiopia in a fun way. She hopes Tibab girls will become a success and help challenge taboos. We're starting from hardcore subject like stop early marriage. Um, but the thing is, you know, that is why the power of animation is very interesting because it is animation, it is fictional. So people can take a distance and feel comfortable to talk about it. And that's what we want. The first step is talking about it. But it's not always easy. Sometimes I get frustrated, you know, it shouldn't take me 10 years to get to this point. You know, I should reach more kids. Uh, I should have been by now, you know, in all East Africa. Distributing the programs is difficult and resources are scarce. Social entrepreneurship is not yet common in Ethiopia. The policies don't support us because we're still looked at as a business person. So we've been tasked taxed the same way. What that means is we're frugal. We're frugal innovators. We have small resource, we have to do a lot. But the team behind Tibeb Girls is strong and motivated, and they won't give up in the face of these obstacles. They're still negotiating with TV broadcasters. <laughs> The winter skies over Punjab in northern India are once again turning dark as farmers burn off the remains of their crop. Although bad for the air, farmers say they often have no other alternative. We have this report. Punjab, India, a land of burning fields. These have become yearly scenes as farmers set fire to straw left over from their summer rice harvests to make room for their winter crops. The practice is a major contributor to North India's severe winter air quality issues. And last year, pollution levels in New Delhi rose to nearly 30 times higher than World Health Organization standards. Surinder Panjola has been farming in the district of Patiala for 15 years. But last year's pollution crisis led him to rethink his farming practices. Every year we used to burn the straw and it had a negative impact on the environment. Now the government has put a restriction against this practice and some of us have tried to find a solution for it. We want to protect the environment. 
Surinder's solution is a chopping machine, which he and another farmer invested around 2,500 euros in earlier this year. It allows them to remove straw easily and put it back in their fields to help with their winter crops. About 35 kilometers away, another alternative to crop burning is in effect. Straw from nearby farms is chopped up at this local power plant so it can be used as fuel to create electricity. The plant uses contractors to collect straw from fields with machines called balers. But there are limitations to how many farms they can cover in such a short window of time. Many of these farmers are already in severe debt. And until they get the assistance they need, they say there's no choice but to set their fields alight. Someone else should solve this problem. The government should lift the straw themselves or pay us compensation to clear the fields. We are fed up with this situation. Farmers know the environmental consequences of crop burning. But as long as it remains the cheapest way for them to clear their fields, it will be a long time before more buy into alternative solutions. Concerns about the economy in Catalonia are growing in the wake of the region's bid for independence. Tourism has slumped, and the ongoing political stalemate is taking its toll. Patrick Schmidt works as a tourist guide. Just five people have signed up to his tour of the famous Sagrada Familia. Not a good sign considering the church lies at the heart of Barcelona's tourist trail. We're seeing more cancellations than usual. We're almost 25% down since October. People are afraid. With no official figures available yet, it's too early to know exactly how big an effect Spain's political crisis is having on tourism overall. But anecdotal reports suggest the problem is acute. Restaurant owner Carlos Manresa has noticed a significant drop in clientele since September. We're 30% down compared to the year before. I think we'll have to let staff go if things go on like this. It's really bad, but the problem is the situation is ongoing. Hotel owners in Barcelona appear reluctant to discuss the crisis. But the word on the street is that bookings are down about 10% since the referendum. 80 kilometers away in Tarragona, hotel owner Javier Gemne is more upfront. He says Spanish tourists are boycotting Catalonia. In este momento, at the moment, we're seeing a 10 to 15 percent reduction in tourists from Spain. The total portion of tourists from Spain is 30 percent. But some warn that without official numbers, there's a risk of the consequences being overblown and anecdotal evidence being used to inspire fear. Tourism is a pillar of both the Spanish and Catalan economies, so people use information to overstate the consequences as a kind of warning to the Catalan government. While industry insiders await the exact figures, it seems hard to dispute that Spain's political crisis is hurting tourism. That's especially worrying for people like Patrick Schmidt, whose livelihoods depend on it. One in five Catalans work in the tourism industry. And our last report takes us to Russia. This week saw the return of Moscow's St. Peter and Paul Cathedral to the country's Lutheran Church. Under Stalin, Protestant Lutheran churches had been closed, along with many belonging to the majority Russian Orthodox faith. An air of celebration at a normal Sunday service, the last one before this evangelical Lutheran congregation in Moscow officially gets its church back. Lutherans are a religious minority here in Russia. Most in the community have German roots. Their ancestors came to Russia centuries ago on the invitation of the Tsars, who promised land and religious freedom. But later, the Soviet government persecuted Lutherans and seized church property, including this cathedral. The community, led by Archbishop Dietrich Brauer, has been using it again since the fall of the Soviet Union, but so far it has remained Russian government property. 
It's like someone started living in your apartment, and it's not yours anymore. They let you turn up, but the whole time you have the feeling that it isn't yours. At any point, it could end up in government hands or other hands. But now it's ours, it feels like home again. In the officially atheist Soviet Union, many churches were repurposed. From 1937, this cathedral was used as a movie theater and a film studio. By then, all Lutheran churches across the country had been closed and many of their pastors arrested and shot. Here at Vidyenske Cemetery in Moscow, long known as the city's German cemetery, the scars of that persecution are still tangible. Many gravestones here were neglected and destroyed. After the Second World War, the Lutheran community struggled with the additional stigma of its German origins, often associated with the Nazi enemy. The return of our church to some extent restores historical justice, historical truth, but only partially. I hope that this will just be the beginning of a new stage in the development of our country and our community. The number of churches that were destroyed and can no longer be returned, that's a crime, of course. The fact that the cathedral is being returned to us now is good news. This church belongs to the congregation. It belongs to the people that come here and look after it. Now the congregation is getting a church to call home. And since it's in the capital, they hope this transfer will set a precedent and that the Russian state will return other churches as well.